Hey there, this is Steve Holmes, Creative Director of Energy Design in San Francisco, welcoming you to another video tutorial here on Artbeats.com. Now in this session I'm going to show you how to really break the boundaries of 3D work in After Effects. Now the technical term is 2.5D, as After Effects doesn't extrude objects to give them a third dimension. But with these techniques for setting up and lighting your scene, and combining it with a couple of very useful clips from Artbeats for animated shadow creation, I'm going to show you just how to achieve that extra half D. So here I am in my After Effects document and I've got one composition called Paris 3D Layers. Now this is a 3D composition that's been created using layers imported from Photoshop. I had one Photoshop file called Dark Skyline and all of the layers inside it have been imported in. Now these layers are actually really nicely styled. They're basically cut out shapes of various buildings and monuments in Paris and then I've blended them with a paper texture and handwriting to give this really nice sort of hand constructed look, almost like these are uh, paper cutouts or something like that. It's, it's really quite unique. Now if I scrub through the timeline you can see that I've already arranged these in 3D space and I've added a camera move. Okay, So I'm just scrubbing through slowly here and you'll notice that part way through we get these really nice 3D ribbons appearing and that's basically an illustrator file. You can see that over here in the project panel as well. These have been animated using masks to simply reveal them from one side to the other. Okay, So even though it looks 3D there are only two dimensional layers. The 3D itself was actually created in Illustrator just so you know. And if I come across and look at this from a slightly different angle inside our 3D offset view, I'm just going to pull around here so we can see how those layers are constructed. Okay, So you get a, a sense of distance between the, the layers themselves and the background, and here is the camera. Okay, And as you drag back and forth, you can see that small camera icon moving in the scene. So looking at it again from the front and from the actual camera view, this is the scene itself. What we want to do now is enhance it by adding some shadows. And really, lights and shadows are fairly easy to add inside of After Effects, but what we want to do is enhance this using shadow movement, and that can really be done two ways. We can use animated light sources, we can also use animated shadow casters. Well, we're going to use both. So the first and most important step is to add a light into the scene because that's what creates all of the shadows. So let's come up to the layer menu, I'm at zero seconds in the timeline, go down to new and choose light. Now I can leave the light name or you can call it spotlight, we're only going to have one light in the scene so it doesn't matter in this instance, but I am going to leave the light type as a spotlight, the intensity at 100%. I'm going to increase the cone angle to around about 120 degrees just to give it a little bit more coverage so we, we make sure that we light most of the layers in the scene, maybe a bit dark around the edges. And then I'll also slightly reduce the cone feather to around about 30. You can also change the color of the light source in here so that will basically affect the temperature of your scene, which is fine. Um, but I sometimes if you've got layers like this which have already been sort of hand colored and constructed in Photoshop and are, you know color correct already I wouldn't recommend adding color changes to an entire scene by affecting a light color here because then you really sort of lose control over those individual layers if you want to tweak them later what I would suggest is color adjusting them on a layer by layer basis you, you have so much more control so I'm going to leave the light as white keeps it nice and neutral and uh, for the moment I'm going to leave cast shadows turned off it's usually easier easier to construct a scene in 3D with lighting to get the light position correct first before we go ahead and turn on the shadows and see the results. Make sure that's turned off. Go ahead and click OK and you can see it's dropped in the middle of the scene, okay, or fairly middle, slightly offset, and it's also um, slightly in front of some of these layers which is why they're black because the light is now in front of them and is not pointing at them. So we can change that in just a second. What I am going to do though is go up to the layer menu go down to transform and choose auto orient down here and make sure I turn off the auto orientation so the light itself is not pointing towards this central point it's it's pointing right down the middle of the scene it's not sort of forcing itself into an angle now as you can see like I mentioned all of the layers are responding to the light source and its position which is very cool for this instance it allows us to position the light and soften the edges and all of those layers will look like they're inside this scene and lit for this instance it's perfect sometimes you might not want that you might want all of the layers to retain their original color and shading so the light doesn't affect them, you can actually disable that in the material settings and I can show you that briefly later on. First what we want to do though is position this light a lot further away so we light more of the scene. So over here in the timeline I'm just going to pull up the lights position values and play around with a few settings. What I'll do is let's just go to say F11, Okay, we can see this from an angle, you can see how that's affecting the scene and if I go ahead and drag here on the Z axis 
and drag back, you can see exactly how it's now revealing those layers once it sits behind them or in front of them, okay? So basically we're just gonna reposition this to suit the exact part of the design. So I'm gonna jump back to the camera view here and make a couple of changes. I'm gonna do this manually because I've got the settings already. I'm gonna change the x-axis here to 540 and the y-axis to 600, so it's a little bit lower in the scene, okay? And I'm gonna position it a long way away. I'm gonna go minus 4,000 pixels, okay? That pulls us far, far away, so we've now got the entire scene covered in light. Again, if I switch back to F11, you can see the light is now all the way over here, so the cone angle is now nice and wide that it just starts to cut off around the edges, okay? So just sort of a, a subtle change there. But this also means that the shadows that will be cast will be pulled closer to Together. If your light source is further away from elements that are close together, their shadows will be a little bit more compact and in fact gives us a little bit more control. But again, it's something you can play with as you go through. Now I do want to animate this light, so what I'm going to do is switch to the front view and we can see its current position and I'm going to do like a sunrise type effect where the light is low so the shadows will be slightly cast upwards and then across the 10 seconds duration of the timeline I'm going to have this sort of move upwards and slightly to the left to give the impression of sunrise and then any of the shadows in the scene will also move as well and this, this will look really really nice. So I'm making sure I'm at zero seconds on the timeline. I'm gonna go ahead and add a position keyframe for the values that are already entered there. And then I'm gonna jump straight to the end of the timeline, just hit the end key to go right to the very end. I'm gonna make a couple of simple changes. I'm gonna change the X position to about 160, which you see moves it across to the left. And the Y value I'm gonna to change to zero, so it's all the way up in the sky. Now the Z axis, that's gonna stay as it is. But now if I scrub back through the timeline there, you can see the light is essentially is moving in a sunrise type direction, okay? Now, whether that's east-west correct, you know, don't, uh, don't shoot me if that's the case, but uh, at least we've got a rising um, animation here and that should look realistic once we go ahead and turn the shadows on. Now, talking of turning shadows on, I did mention about the material properties for layers, okay? So layers that are affected by light or not, well, the same rule applies for shadows, where the layers can interact with each other, cast shadows, receive shadows, and so on. So before we sort of take the next steps of adding shadows and that sort of thing, we do want to make sure that the layers are set up correctly so that when we turn on the lights, everything works perfectly. So I'm gonna come down to any one of these 3D layers in the timeline. Really doesn't matter which one it is. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose maybe main wall one okay now this if I just go ahead and solo it you can see it's the main item in the foreground okay so go ahead and turn that back on now if I twirl down the material options you can see the basic settings are right here does this layer cast shadows that's currently set to off so let's go ahead and turn that on does it accept shadows absolutely that's the default and does it accept lights in this case yes we're going to leave that to on but that's what I was talking about if you don't want the layers to be affected by the uh, the position of the light itself you can always say don't accept lights lights and it will retain its original color and brightness. Now the material options like this need to be set for each and every 3D layer in order to keep them consistent. The nice thing is we can cut and paste. So I'm going to select material options there, press command C or control C on the PC to copy that into memory and I'm just going to twirl these down and then go ahead and select the other layers. So in fact if I just go ahead select the top one select all the way down to the bottom one with the shift key and hit paste, they will all now have exactly the same 3D material options applied, okay? So now that's done, I can go ahead and turn the shadows on. I'm just gonna jump back to the main 3D camera view and then come back up to the light, double click to bring up the properties and go ahead and say cast shadows. Now you can see immediately in the background that you have the shadow being applied at 100% with no diffusion, which looks really actually very, very nice at this point. What we're gonna do is lighten this up a little bit. I'm gonna trim this down to about 70%, something like that, maybe even a shade less, but as you can see, it's very easy to change later on if we need to. What I'm going to do is increase the diffusion. Now this basically softens the edge of the shadow based on the distance that the object is from the light. So the further it is away, the softer it will get. And this, this again is something that you can play around with, but this is one of my favorite settings in After Effects. The ability to base uh, diffusion on the distance from a light source is, is really quite incredible. So I'm gonna set that to round about 70 and three, go ahead and click OK. And we can see that again, if I scrub through the timeline here using um, just a, a very sort of low resolution version, you can see the shadows are there and you can see that as the animation goes on the shadows do actually change position because remember we have a sunrise now so the tops of these buildings are very visible towards the end because the sun is higher in the sky or the light is essentially 
come back to the beginning they're much lower so we've got a really nice starting point here now you may be looking at this and thinking well where are the shadows on the background if I jump to our side view here and rotate around you'd be very right in asking that question we have a light source in the distance shining through all of these layers all of which are set to cast shadows on each other and indeed the background the background doesn't have any well there's a reason for that okay I'm gonna go ahead and show you why if I come down to the bottom of the timeline the paint background this is the layer I imported from Photoshop this actually has layer styles applied okay if I twirl down here and look at layer styles I've got a color overlay and a gradient overlay if I turn them off you'll notice two things one the color completely changes that was the original color of the layer in Photoshop and then I added the layer styles in Photoshop which were also imported into After Effects which is really nice but you'll also notice that the shadow works when you turn off the layer styles well we need the layer styles we can't get the shadow so I'm going to show you a really nice trick using something called a shadow catcher now you may be asking yourself what is a shadow catcher well very simply it's a layer that I'm going to create it's just a regular layer it's not like a special feature that After Effects has but it's a layer that I'm going to tell to catch the shadow and then render it over the top of the background so this is a nice little trick that we use many many times here in the studio to to get around this particular problem now another way to get around it is you could pre-compose the background layer which would then put the layer effects inside that layer but then you have to go in and adjust the size of the composition and, and the, there are a lot of additional settings required personally I like to do this and add a little shadow catcher because it also gives me a little bit more control over the density of the shadow okay so what I'm going to do again at zero seconds in the timeline I'm gonna go up to layer new and create a new solid layer and in the solid settings I'm gonna create a shadow catcher name and I'm gonna change the size I'm gonna go really big here maybe 5,000 pixels square it really doesn't matter in the size because you can stretch it to fit the size of your composition afterwards it's a solid it, it really doesn't matter but I'm going to start with that as a default and then more importantly I'm going to go into the color settings here and change this just to white okay if yours is already set to white by all means go ahead and leave that so now I'm going to say okay it drops it in the scene I'm going to drag it down here just so it's above the background one not that that matters but it's just a little bit easier to find more importantly I'm going to make sure it's a three-dimensional layer which now sits in the scene and as you can see the shadows are already being applied and I do want to make sure it's in the same position as the paint background because it obviously wants to sit in the same location for the shadows to be in the right position so easy way to do that I'm going to select the position value for the paint background select it copy it select the shadow catcher and simply paste and that will paste it into the exact position location now very importantly we want to make sure that the size of this layer is big enough to fill our entire background so I'm going to jump back over to our camera view here and obviously you can see it's a little too small okay this is still working very very well so all I need to do is go ahead and scale this up to fit the size of the comp and make sure that it basically covers the edges of the composition at the extremities of the camera move okay so even though this is up you know 200 percent or whatever it doesn't make a difference the shadow itself will still be perfect it, it doesn't sort of have to be a, a top quality layer we're simply stretching it out to cast a shadow on so likewise I'm going to go back to the beginning just make sure there's no problems there okay so now shadows on the background which is perfect one more thing I want to change with regards to the position is if I go ahead and select both of those layers you can see that their position values are both the same okay naturally we copied and pasted them if two layers exist in the same 3d space in After Effects you can occasionally get render errors I'm not saying it happens all the time but I do know that you really should keep them separate even if it's by half a pixel or one pixel which in this case when it's 4,000 pixels away from the center point you're not going to notice a pixel difference okay so just to be on the safe side to avoid any intersection of layers I'm going to change that to 3,000 999 pixels so basically move it one pixel closer to the camera away from the back wall so the final step there is simply to say blend this layer with the background that's behind it so toggle the switches and modes look at the blending modes here and I'm just gonna go up and apply multiply because the layer itself is white that disappears the shadow that's cast on it is now multiplied onto the background and there you now have your shadow caster now I would also just go into the material options for this 
We're going to make sure that we don't have cast shadows because we wouldn't want this layer to cast a shadow onto the background itself. We do wish for it to accept shadows from other layers, which is what it's doing. But in this case, I don't want it to accept any of the lights, okay? So the original background layer is, is slightly restored. We don't sort of have another layer of shading from the white layer because don't forget the white layer will be affected by the cone angle of the 3D light in the background. So little option there just to go ahead and turn off, but it's a really nice way to combine um, two elements together. You Use one to catch the shadow and then blend it with the background on which it's supposed to fall. So there's your shadow catcher. Now one more reason to point out why the shadow catcher is so cool is if we wanted to adjust the intensity of the shadows, as you know, we could go back into the light and change the shadow darkness here. But remember, that changes the entire scene. Well, if we made the shadow, say, 100%, so everything here was dark, but we wanted the background one to be lighter, remember that the background one would be receiving a shadow of 100%, okay? But because it's being applied to a layer, which is being blended with the one behind it, we could select the shadow catcher layer and go to the opacity and drop that down and actually fade out the background shadow as much as we want to. So this is really quite unique. You're taking uh, sort of one overall shadow effect and having the ability to adjust individual shadows based on a simple opacity. So just wanted to point that out whilst we're there. So now that the layers, the light and the shadow and the catcher in the background are all in place, what I'm going to do is a quick RAM preview of this so we can see how it's looking at this stage. And it looks really, really cool. I think, I think this is a really interesting technique that we're working with here. Now, I want to take this a step further and add some very unique animated shadows. And this is actually going to be people walking with their shadows cast across the offset layers, which will force the shadows to break up into different sizes and positions be because of the, the Z position offset of the 3D layers they're landing on. And it will really add that final sort of half dimension of, of 3D that we spoke about. So let's take a look at doing that. So this is where the Artbeats clips will come into play. What I'm going to do is jump across to my browser and I've brought up Artbeats.com. And what I'm going to do is come up here into the search area and simply do a search for people walking. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and say OK, which is going to give me roughly 800 clips. Actually, I'm right. Look at that. 805 clips that are tagged with people walking. Now, the particular type of clip I'm looking for is very specific. And I'm going to come over here to refine the search on the left hand side and choose this collection, the Ribbit Films collection because these are a series of clips that have been shot and keyed on a green screen background and this is exactly what I'm looking for. So if you were using this for you know full um, image scenario where you need the actual detail, then we would use one of these clips. However, all we want is the basic silhouette of these guys to be able to cast a shadow from. So I can actually use the matte file instead and create exactly the same look. So I've got two documents here. I've got clip 10301 matte and I'm gonna use this one as well, 10301 to Matt. All right. So these are the two clips directly from artbeats.com that I've got downloaded. And now I'm going to pull back over into After Effects. So I'm just going to come over here into my project panel and just double click to bring up the import dialog box. And these are the two clips right here. So I'm just going to go ahead and select them and say open. Now, these are specific clips that contain alpha channels. They've been rendered and supplied with an alpha channel that we need to interpret on the way into After Effects. So it recognizes it's an alpha channel. It's going to use a straight unmatted interpretation which is absolutely fine I'm just gonna go ahead and say okay and do okay again for the second clip I'm just gonna deselect and open one of them by double clicking it so we can see it here in the main window and in fact I'll just drop down 50% there and scrub through this so what we're seeing here in fact is kind of a, an anti-aliased edge around what is transparent so let's go ahead and turn on the transparent background and you can see exactly what we've got so essentially even though we have an alpha channel in this case After Effects is interpreting it inside out or back to front. So we simply need to change that. So I'm going to go ahead and select the clip over here, go to interpret footage, and in the dialog box, I'm going to say invert alpha. It's as simple as that. Go ahead and say OK, and you see it's now switched over here in this one. OK, so perfect. We've got the exact shapes we want. It doesn't matter that they're white. The important thing is, is that they're solid because that's what the shadow will be cast from. Now, likewise, we need to do the same with clip two over here. So again, interpret footage, invert the alpha and say OK. I'm going to go ahead and close that one down. And then I'm going to make a new composition from the first one of these. Now, essentially, because it's already got the alpha channel in, you could add it straight to this composition as a 3D layer, put it in front of the light, and tell it to cast shadows. That will work. However, I like to put this inside a pre-comp because I might want to make changes. I might want to trim the footage, edit it slightly, maybe mask something off. It's easier if that is inside a different composition. It just keeps things a little bit easier to control. 
control. So that's why I'm going to do this. I'm going to select the clip and just drag it straight down onto the new composition icon to create a brand new comp to the same size and length. And again, if I scrub through that timeline, you can now see, okay, we've got our transparency in the background. So one of the reasons I did that is the very beginning, don't forget our timeline in the main one is 10 seconds long, okay? So at the beginning of this one, there's no real activity and I just want the shadows to appear right from the very beginning. So what I'm going to do is drag this clip down and essentially choose a new in point. So I'm going to start somewhere around here where there are people People already on screen as I drag through we get a little bit of a blank spot there and then as we reach towards 10 seconds we get more activity again okay so I'm gonna go in fact to 10 seconds here set my endpoint and trim the work area out so we've got an exact 10 second timeline and then what I want to do is essentially fix this blank area in the middle and that's where the second clip comes in we can add a different layer of people walking here okay so I'm gonna grab our second movie drag this also into the timeline at round about two seconds or wherever it needs to be and we now have multiple layers of people walking back and forth and that fills in the gaps very very nicely now again it doesn't matter about these overlaps because after effects won't be rendering these it'll be seeing this as one solid shape and casting a shadow from it okay so this is why i use the pre-comp so if i now switch back over to the paris 3d layers making sure i'm at zero seconds we can now take this pre-comp that contains both of those layers you just saw and drag it down into the timeline and essentially this can go near the top so it sits near the light it's easy again to locate most importantly go back to the switches and make sure it's a 3d layer at this point in time now i'm going to leave the scale set to 100 percent but we do want to play around with the position value because it's very important where this sits in relation to the light and how it will then cast shadows across the background if i just hit the space bar here we can see that we have the original characters moving which is all well and good but we do need this to affect shadows okay so we're going to play around with a couple of things here i'm going to position this so it's kind of in line with the light itself so I think we had that set to 540 and we've got 600 as well on the y-axis but we, we can play around with that a little bit later on. I'm going to leave that at 360 for now. However, the Z position is also the most important. Remember that the light is 4,000 pixels away. The camera itself, just so we can see that, is round about 1,600 pixels away from the center point. So there's round about 2,400 pixels of distance between these two objects inside which this can sit. If this sits behind the camera, perfect okay so I'm gonna drag this backwards and hold down the shift key and just increase the values very very quickly there and you can see it intersecting through all of those layers okay so it's easy enough to position but I'm going to show you a nice little way to uh, gauge exactly how the shadows are going to work here what I'm going to do is in the timeline solo just the layer that's casting the shadows the light itself and let's also go down the bottom and make sure that our shadow catcher layer is also turned on now I do want to make sure with this particular layer itself that I bring up the material options and make sure that cast shadows is turned on so we can see them on the background and accept lights we'll make sure that's turned off it really doesn't make a difference because we're not going to see this layer in just a second so this is where it now becomes important as to the position of the layer because you can see the edges of the composition are visible on the background and as we move through our scene and we see the shadows all the way to the very end in this case the layer is not big enough to fill the entire background so we could use scale or we can use position or a combination of both it's a, it's a very straightforward technique okay so what I'm going to do is a nice little trick because essentially we've got transparent figures here and we can't see the entire solid shape of the comp okay we don't really know do they disappear here do their heads go off or something like that where are the boundaries of the shadow itself so what I tend to do in this case is jump back across to the actual comp that's got the two transparent layers in it come over into the solids and let's just take our shadow catcher layer and drag that down onto the top okay what it'll do is it'll fill that composition with a solid which now when we switch back to 3d is essentially filling the entire area which is fine but remember that we are with our camera is sitting in the middle here so we're looking at a solid white layer what I'm going to do is position this just behind the camera for a second I'm going to go minus 2000 okay so now you can see the sh the solid that I just inserted is now completely visible in the background this then allows us to very easily go ahead and adjust the Z position there of that shadow layer and make sure that it sits in the background and fills the width okay based on the entire camera move remember so I'm also going to adjust the Y position here as well so we make sure that we don't crop off the top or the bottom at any time and again just scrub through the timeline and see how that works you'll see as we go through the timeline the shadows are actually going to get lower so I'm going to make sure that that stays a little bit higher 
you can scale it, you can play around with it. There are many different settings here that could affect it. And, you know, to be honest, there are a lot of shadows in the scene. You probably won't notice this edge, even if a figure does walk in off the edge. But I'm trying to show you a way here that you can sort of uh, trick this into looking and seeing what the overall area is whilst you cast those shadows, okay? So just a, a few guidelines there. If I now go ahead back to the original composition with the shadow catcher shadow area and turn that off, we now get our original objects back. When we come back over here, we can now see those figures. So as we walk through this, we now see, we do get a little bit of cropping on the left there, but do remember that's inside a scene which is very dark on the left-hand side you won't even notice that, okay? But what you do notice is that the shadows are now walking across the background. Have a look at that. That's really very, very cool. And as you can see here, also moving across the foreground and they're divided and split and offset based on the 3D position of these layers. And even check this out. It's going over the ribbon, the 3D ribbon as it moves. So very, very cool and a very easy way to apply those shadows straight down the scene. Now, one more important thing. I did mention that the shadow casting layer Layer is behind the camera. Well, what if it isn't? You're going to see it and you're going to end up with the same problem we had a second ago where everything that's white sits in front of the camera. You don't want that. If I jump over to our custom view, you can see the exact problem. Here is the light. That's fine. The object has to sit in front of the light for the shadow to be cast. And in this instance, the camera is over here. But again, what if it wasn't? If this layer was sitting over here, you would see it. Well, here's one really nice feature of After Effects. And this has been in here a long time, but I think it's a very, very handy option. If we come back over to the shadow options for this layer or the material settings, okay, and you can see the cast shadows we set to on. If you click that a further time, we have an only option. It means that the shadow is still cast, but the layer itself is completely invisible. So it can be in front of the camera, you wouldn't even notice, but your shadows are still there. Really very handy. So if I switch back to my main camera view here and go back to the uh, beginning of the timeline, I've got a couple more things that I can do to enhance the scene. Just like a second ago where we had the shadow catcher on the background where the shadow is dropped over here on the darker color, we could affect the transparency of that layer independently of the light source. Well, the cool thing about using this layer to cast a shadow of the people across the background, that also contains its own opacity setting. So if you wanna lighten those shadows, just change the opacity right there. And this is a really, really wonderful thing to do. So it, it's, it's like we have multiple shadow settings that we're creating ourselves as we go along. So leave it to, to whatever setting you need, just play around with it and get the look that you need in the foreground and the background. So a couple of things that I've added into this composition before rendering it. One of the things here in the camera is that I've got depth of field turned on. I just did just wanna show you that. Down here in the camera options, if I go ahead and turn it on, I've got a couple of settings in here. So at the beginning, I've got it already animated. You can see here that the focal distance and the aperture are set to focus on the foreground object to begin with. And as we progress through the timeline, the focal distance and the aperture shift so that we end up with focus on the background object right at the very end. So I've already animated that. I just wanted to show you those settings are in there and everything else that's 3D is also being affected in the same way. And this is really quite nice. It just sort of adds to this very close and, and intimate um, setting that we have here with shadows and paper and handwriting and stuff like that. I think it's, it's very, very cool. But what I do want to do is add a little bit of soft focus around the outside of the scene and I'm going to use magic bullet looks for this because it's, it's one of my favorite tools for this kind of thing. So I'm just going to twirl up my layers here because those are all essentially done and what I'm going to do is go to layer menu, go down to new and choose adjustment layer. So we create a new adjustment layer over the top of absolutely everything. Then I'm going to go to my effects, go down to magic bullet and apply looks. Okay and this, these filters are wonderful. You can get them from redgiantsoftware.com. And I'm just gonna go ahead and hit edit to bring up the looks builder dialog box. Okay, we get a really nice preview here of our image. And we could go in and do an overall color change here. You may have seen me do this on previous tutorials, but if I went into looks here, we could choose, um, one of my favorites actually down here is uh, the Infusion or Mexicali. I, I really like this sort of intense burnt out look, which is really wonderful. The the, the red, red, white, and blue French uh, stripes in the background will be somewhat affected by this color uh, adjustment, but this in itself, just applying one look and this burnt effect on the paper, 
absolutely stunning. I, I really like it. In this case, I'm not going to use that. I'm just going to go ahead and remove all of those settings. I'm going to come over here to the right hand side to the tools and under the lens settings, I'm just going to apply an edge softness effect. Okay, so just drag this over into the preview window and I'm just going to decrease the amount of effect around the outside by basically narrowing the two radiuses or radii. Uh, between these two circles okay so it's more on the outside then I can come down here to the settings and maybe make that a little bit stronger about five percent somewhere around there go ahead and click OK and we can now see because it's an adjustment layer that's cleanly applied through absolutely everything so combining that with the depth of field um, on both ends of the scene I think it looks looks really nice and it just adds a little bit of blur here and there and, and really pulls everything together so with all of those elements in place I think we're pretty much done with this so if I now show you the finished render, you, you can see the final result, which if I say so myself, which I will, uh, is incredible. It, it, we've not so much as bent the rules of 3D and After Effects as I think tie them in a knot and use them as shoelaces. Uh, the impression of true 3D space is created with carefully constructed and textured Photoshop layers. Um, subtle lighting and a slightly animated light position which affects the basic shadows cast from those layers not to mention the little shadow catcher trick that I showed you on the background layer which contained layer effects however the real enhancement and reality I think is added to the shot thanks to those two wonderful silhouetted clips of the people walking from the Ribbit Films collection at rbeast.com once those shadows are distorted and offset across those 3D scraps of paper it really does take on a whole new and stunning look so I, th I think this is a, a really cool example of just how much you can do in After Effects in terms of 3D so I hope you've enjoyed yet another cool Artbeats video tutorial and have definitely learned some great new technical and design techniques along the way. As always, this is Steve Holmes from Energy Design, and I will see you again soon.